the average person can hold their breath underwater for like one or two minutes. But every day on an archipelago in Southeast Asia, the Bajau people dive down more than 60 meters deep to catch fish, and they can hold their breath for more than 10 minutes. How? That's better. This ability, it doesn't just come from years of training. It's thanks to a genetic change in this population. In other words, it's an example of very recent human evolution that makes a group of people better adapted to their environment. But what about the rest of us? Are we still evolving? As humans live longer, die less, and make more and more tools to protect us from the dangerous world that we live in, does that mean that we've bypassed that great filter of natural selection? What is the future of human evolution? Hey smart people, Joe here. The Bajau people sometimes spend five hours a day holding their breath. I mean, that's more time underwater than a sea otter. What's even cooler is how they do it. So the secret to their superhuman breath holding is an actual physiological change. Bajau spleens are up to 50% larger than yours or mine. You know, the spleen is an underappreciated organ. It acts like an oxygen reservoir by storing red blood cells, the ones that carry oxygen. So a supersized spleen means more oxygen can get into your bloodstream between breaths. Other highly adapted diving mammals, like whales and seals, they have super spleens too. Now, you and me, we can't just beef up our spleens by diving a lot. That's not how evolution works. Bajau divers have lived in a watery environment for thousands of years. Somewhere along the way, a genetic change happened that gave some people there bigger spleens. Those people ate more, they survived more, and over many, many generations, that adaptation became more common. This is natural selection. It's a gene becoming more common in a population over time because the individuals who carry that gene are more likely to survive the pressures of their environment. Since our species showed up, we have spread to every environment on Earth. Our ancestors faced countless environmental pressures, I mean, different foods, different climates. And once we settled down in large groups, domesticated plants and animals, and started building civilizations, we've had to face a lot of deadly germs because civilization is filthy, y'all. A lot of people died as a result of those new pressures, but our ancestors survived, often because of new and improved versions of genes that they carried. Like Himalayan populations whose lungs can breathe air with 40% less oxygen than what most of us breathe. Or people in parts of Africa who are more resistant to the germ that causes Lassa fever. Or how populations who migrated closer to the poles developed lighter skin to make the most of less intense sunlight at high latitudes, you know, since our bodies need sunlight to make vitamin D. And speaking of vitamin D, Let's talk dairy. Ah, love this stuff. Calcium in milk also aids in vitamin D production, but most animals can't digest milk very well after they grow up. Ha <laughs> ha, losers. Luckily for some of us, a genetic change allowed us to keep our milk drinking ability switched on throughout our lives. And because milk is a reliable source of protein and calories, milk drinking evolved independently in lots of different places. Changes like these, and countless others that help shape our species, they happened because of natural selection. Genes becoming more common because they make it easier to survive. But today is different. I mean, humans have invented so many tools. We've got medicines, sanitation, environmentally controlled living pods, more food than we literally know what to do with. I mean, name the last time you thought you might be eaten by a tiger on your way to get lunch, right? People just don't die as much as they used to. Human life expectancy has more than doubled over the past 200 or so years. And now that almost everyone is surviving past the age where they can make babies, does that mean natural selection doesn't apply to us anymore? Is this the post-Darwin age of humanity? Have we entered the hyper-technological transhuman utopia? Have we stopped evolving? No. Because natural selection isn't the only way evolution happens, folks. Some genetic changes just become common by random chance. Let me show you what I mean. This jar is full of M&Ms. Every bag of M&Ms has this population makeup. But this population of M&Ms has a very different makeup from the original population. And so will the future population. And that happened because of a chance event when I grabbed a random handful. 
delicious. Now I could do that again and again, and I'd get different results each time. And this can happen to genes too. When random events decide what genes survive and become more common, not the environment. That's not natural selection. It's genetic drift. So let's say a bunch of highly advanced life forms live here. Until a meteor hits, thanks to random chance, these ones survive. And over time, the population looks a lot different. Or maybe through a series of unfortunate events, a few of them end up on this island. What this new population looks like will depend on the individuals that founded it. This kind of thing happens with humans too. If you're from European ancestry, there's a 90% chance or more you got wet, sticky earwax. If you're Native American or from East Asia, you've got about a 90% chance of having dry, flaky earwax. This difference is caused by two different versions of a single gene. But the type of earwax you have doesn't exactly give you a survival advantage. So which version became more common where? It's probably just the result of which gene version was carried by the first humans to migrate to those regions. Catch my drift? Genetic drift. But these chance effects of genetic drift are more likely to be significant in small isolated populations. And humans are not that. I mean, we move around, we share culture. And as we move around and mix more than ever, genes are mixing too. So that's decreased the genetic differences between human populations overall. And when rare versions of genes do arise, it's more likely that they'll get diluted out by the mixing. Humans living longer or dying less thanks to our awesome inventions may reduce the effect of natural selection. Humans moving around, multiplying and mixing a lot may reduce the effect of genetic drift. That means really wild new adaptations like the Bajau's super spleens are probably going to be less common in the future. When you put all of this together, well, a lot of people have claimed that as Darwin's ideas lose their grip on us, and as humans move around and mix ourselves up, we're gonna start looking more and more alike. But that's not how this stuff works. I mean, even things like skin color or eye color, they involve a symphony of dozens of genes all interacting in a ton of combinations. I mean, just consider the variation in physical appearance we already see today in people with mixed ancestry people will always be plenty different. There is one more process though that can influence our evolution apart from natural selection. And it has to do with how babies happen. Ask your parents. Genes don't just randomly find each other. Individuals have a choice in who they mate with. If you're attracted to the largest, fanciest antlers in a herd, well, that will lead to fancier antlered babies even if fancy antler genes don't necessarily make you better suited to your environment. This is an example of sexual selection, where the genes that survive are tied to who picks who to do the mating thing. Now, how sexual selection will impact the future of human evolution, that's up for debate. But let's say the things that we're attracted to today are tied to intelligence. And many scientists think at least some are. That might mean more future humans that have traits tied to intelligence, like bigger brains or a genetic predisposition to watch this YouTube channel. Again, this isn't genes that help us survive a germ or our environment. It's genes that may just make us more sexy. Now, this last part may feel a little bit icky depending on how exactly you feel about things, but thanks to our tools, the future of human evolution may be, in part, something that we can control, or at least try to. Our species already relies on machines to survive and thrive, and we're only gonna continue to rely more on those machines in the future, while taking more and more power out of the hands of natural selection along the way. And we will increasingly not just depend on machines for help, but one day we're gonna be physically or neurally integrated with them, and frankly, no one knows what that will do to our genes or which ones become more or less common. With genetic engineering, we now have the ability to insert custom genetic sequences into living things, even ourselves, perhaps even pick and choose the genes that we want our offspring to have. This is a form of evolution that really no other species can do. How big of an influence these future forces have on our species is also up to us but it will almost certainly have some effect. Evolution is just change, and that's a process that never stops for our species or any other. 
Natural selection happens to be just one way that evolution happens, but there are many others. So even if our big brains have made it so natural selection doesn't determine our future as much as it used to, change is a constant. You know, it's pretty interesting to think that we may be the only species on Earth with the power to determine at least a little bit of what our future change looks like. And that is a power that comes with great responsibility and also hopefully comes with a cold glass of milk and an Oreo. Stay curious. Hey, what's up guys? I'm down here in Florida making our next episode. But before you go, I wanna tell you something that's gonna make the history buffs out there pretty excited. PBS has just launched a brand new history focused YouTube channel. It's called PBS Origins. It's gonna be home to a bunch of great new shows, but right now you can go check out Historian's Take, which is a look at history through the lens of pop culture. What old cultures can teach us about our own and our future, you're gonna love it. There's a link down in the description where you can go check them out and make sure and tell them that I sent you. All right, we'll see you in the next video. And as always, a huge thank you to everyone who supports the show on Patreon. We could not do this without your support. If you would like to find out how you can support the show and the videos we make, find out what we're doing behind the scenes, things like that, and find out about new videos before anyone else, click the link down in the description. I'll see you in the next video. Rolling. Nice. Bring your cookies. Went wrong. Please try it again. Who's talking to you? That's true. Cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got one shot at that.